All right, there's Senator Ron Paul, excuse me, former uh, Congressman Ron Paul, uh, sending a chill up and down his son's sign, his son's spine, Rand Paul. We are on the grassroots system panel, and joining me in studio, as I did previously, is political strategist Jeff Corliss. Good to see you again, Jeff. Also in studio is behavioral expert Adam Heller. Adam, what is a behavioral expert? I'm somebody who analyzes behavior and helps people make changes to whatever their responses and behaviors are. Okay, very good. And joining us from Washington, D.C., is Washington Times reporter and attorney Alex Sawyer. Alex, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Happy 2015. Happy 2015. Let's get to what we just heard Ron Paul say there. Um, Jeff Corliss, basically Ron Paul is saying that our actions around the world have invited the retaliation, have invited the, the violence of of uh, radical Islam. I think the guy is nuts on this. Radical Islam hates us because of who we are. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy was shot and killed in the 60s, not because of our policies towards uh, Iraq or Iran. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that we are the infidel. And when we hear conversations like Ron Paul saying what he said, it's it just is uh, not not conducive to solving the problem. Well, it's the chicken, which came first, the chicken or the egg argument. I mean, either you believe uh, radical extremists who uh, engage in terrorist activities is wrong or you don't. And so either America is right and they are wrong or the other way around. And I think we all know the right answer to that question. Uh, Adam Heller, when it comes to comedy uh, and, re and religion and politics, where should we draw the line or should we draw the line? Because, of course, there was this uh, uh, satirical cartoon of Mo the Prophet Muhammad, but this, this, uh, this newspaper cr in Paris created sat sat satirical cartoons on several subject matter, not just uh, Islam itself. Well, cartoons are supposed to be funny. In this case, we have something that really isn't funny. And I'm an expert in, in behavior. And what causes behavior, like we've seen, is pain and emotion, anger, sadness, fear, hurt, guilt, shame. That's what creates this kind of behavior. That coupled with this self-image and beliefs that say, hey, it's a really good idea to go out and shoot up a magazine. And that's what causes these behaviors. And, and frankly, it doesn't have to be Paris. I see the same stuff every day in my practice with people that blow up their marriages and their careers and their physical pain. And there's no difference between what, what the process of shooting up a building in Paris or a parent going berserk on the referee of their kid's basketball game. I've, I've seen that. I've, I've been that referee. <laughs> uh, let's go to Alex Square in Washington. Alex, what concerns me here, uh, following up on the question of w should we should we be concerned about uh, comedy as it relates to religion and politics? My concern here is we are now entering a slippery slope where um, we are becoming concerned, and it's the radical Islamist, those that uh, wrap themselves and, and embrace Sharia law, that will begin to win the cultural battle, which is bad news for all of us. Do you agree or disagree? I absolutely agree. I think that we can also see what happened with the comedy, with the movie The Interview, and the threats that we faced from the hackers, and possibly it was North Korea, and the uh, American society somewhat wanting to step away from showing this freedom of expression. And unfortunately, we are the only country that has that First Amendment, but it is the First Amendment. So it's important that our president and everyone steps forward and expresses that we aren't going to shy away from what we believe in to accommodate jihadist extremists. And I understand we were talking about behavior, but this is more than a behavior. This is an extreme belief in one's religion to a whole different degree. And it's something that we definitely shouldn't back down to. Adam Heller, you talked about behavior. At the outset of the show, I spoke with Frank Gaffney, national security expert Frank Gaffney, and, and um, my, one of my premises was that we need, we need, we being the world, $1.6 billion, $1 billion Muslim population, we need moderate Muslims to step up and shout out against the radical violence that occurs with, from those within or on the fringes of their religion. 
Uh, Senator Lindsey Graham said uh, that this is how the KKK was shut down, that with its radical, violent behavior, is that those people in the South stood up and spoke out against it in growing numbers. And without, without moderate Muslims st stepping up and speaking out against the behavior of radical extremists, the war against the radicals cannot be won. When you see such silence from moderates within that religion, as a behavioral expert, what, does, what strikes you? Well, it, it frustrates, I, I have my own emotions and it frustrates me and it, it is beliefs and it is behaviors and I agree with that wholeheartedly. They're not responsible for this killing. They are responsible for not stepping up and saying something because my clients will listen to me. They'll come to me with problems, they'll listen to me. The people that are shooting up these buildings, that are flying planes into buildings, they're not gonna listen to us. They may listen to them. So it's the imams and the leaders in that religion that need to step up and come out of that silence and say, hey, you're not honoring your religion, you're dishonoring it, and this is how it's gonna change. Is there anything to conclude uh, as a behavioral expert, behavioral expert of that silence, or is it completely unrelated to two? I think, again, it comes down to emotions. It's fear, they don't wanna be accosted, it's right. easy, they move away, they don't have any problems, they don't have to deal with anything, and they frankly leave the rest of us to deal with Jeff it. Jeff Corliss, you were, uh, as I say, former political director for Carly Fiorina. She may run for president. You are a GOP consultant, a strategist. This seems like an important issue for a 2016 presidential candidate. Not the only issue, but an important issue to, to come out and speak up, speak out on it and articulate leadership on. Absolutely, it does. It really actually puts a bigger focus on the immigration issue because who's crossing our border in the, sor in the south and in the north? We need to know. We, we saw what happened in Paris, and that was a direct tie to a failure of their immigration system and how they're reviewing people entering their country. The person that, uh, one of the people that committed the acts, you know, traveled to Syria and was detained. So their it, systems it, failed. Immigration, sure yes. Our don't. Immigration, our yes. But I believe there's a whole other component sure. to that. And we'll get to that component sure. on the other side of this sure. break. And uh, as we go to the break, the Michael Brown case continues to reverberate. Here how the ACLU has involved itself. We'll have that next. Uh, but first, Conan O'Brien last night bottom lines the Paris tragedy from the edge of America. I'm Rick Amato. Back after this. This story really hits home for anyone who day in and day out mocks political, social, and religious figures. In this country, we just take it for granted that it's our right to poke fun at the untouchable or the sacred. But today's tragedy in Paris reminds us very viscerally that it's a right some people are inexplicably forced to die for. So uh, it is very important tonight that I express that everybody who works at our comedy show and believe it or not, this is a comedy show. That's what we're trying to do here. All of us are terribly sad for the families of those victims, for the people of France, and for anyone in the world tonight who now has to think twice before making a joke. It's not the way it's supposed to be. All right, welcome back, everybody. We continue with our grassroots citizen panel. Before the break, we were talking about uh, the fact that, that the freedom of speech is being, is the, the war on freedom of speech is being lost anytime we limit our speech to, to capitulate to radical Islam. And Jeff Corliss, GOP political consultant, uh, I asked you, what can we expect, what should we expect to see from a real leader in a 2016 presidential uh, campaign from the Republican side of things to, to, uh, to articulate on this? You, you chose immigration as an issue. I want to take it a different angle. What about the idea that if you speak out against those who mean us harm, if they're not, if they're, their color is non-Caucasian, you get labeled as a racist. You get labeled as intolerant. In Germany, 15,000 citizens, non-radical, took to the streets last month and spoke out and marched, protested against radical Islam, and they were labeled as Nazis. That's a dangerous sign that, and it's part of the narrative of political correctness in America. I want to see I don't care if it's Republican or Democrat, but you're a GOP strategist. I want to see a Republican presidential candidate address that square on. Might we, what sort of message should we see? I mean, I, I can't imagine Ronald Reagan not taking that straight on in a positive way. Well, I think that uh, a successful presidential candidate uh, in 2016 will <clears throat> find a way to uh, highlight that 
our country cannot pick and choose which issues we're going to defend. And we've seen that from the current president. Um, he picks and chooses. And we need every time someone speaks out uh, and exercises their First Amendment rights that it's defended and that our country stands by that person or those people or those groups, even if uh, the policy is not something they agree with. It's in general, it's about supporting the First Amendment rights of those individuals. All right, let's go to our behavioral expert, Adam Heller. Adam, as you said, as I, as I said, I want to see a leader hit that issue straight on, not cower and be afraid of political correctness. At the same time, it's got to be said in a way that's inclusive, includes all Americans, does not pit us against them. How should a leader, a Republican or Democrat, who wants to run for president in 2016, how should an expert, not an expert, a candidate, articulate that message? Well, there's no question. Freedom is freedom. And, and you're right, it is in the way I, I teach persuasion. So this is all about persuading people, and it's engaging people in their model of the world. So the way you do it is there are two kinds of mo it's It's motivation. There are two kinds of motivation. Some of us are toward, away, carrot, stick. So the bottom line is to lay out any program in a way that will take us away from the pain of not doing that and towards the yummy feeling of doing that. And it's just laying it out in a way that we all get the benefit that we want from it. it do left, right, doesn't matter. It's just about laying it out and explaining it in a way that people can accept it. Alex Royer, do you think we might see that in 2016 from a pr uh, presidential candidate? I am not optimistic. I want to be wrong. Uh, I, want, I want to be wrong. I am not optimistic. We're going to see a strong, bold leader from the Republican Party come out and say, radical Islam is wrong. Here is why. And here, here why, here's why it's a danger to all Americans. And here's what we should do about it. I think you're right. I think, unfortunately, there's going to be many candidates that are going to be too afraid to stick their necks that far out. However, I think that we do have some leaders in the GOP who would stand up and not necessarily be politically correct all the time and, and would use their mouth. For example, we know Perry has stood up against Obama on many issues. I actually think even Chris Christie might be um, more vocal than some of the other potential candidates that we've seen. I'm, one, I'm wondering if Jeb Bush might be a little bit more hesitant, seeing that he's also following in his brother's footsteps if he does run. Interesting point, whether or not Jeb Bush feels limited in what, what he can say and not say, uh, given the Bush legacy. Before we move on, you care to weigh in with your comment on that? Well, he's always been labeled as a moderate or not conservative enough, so um, one could argue that if that's truly the case, he might be more inclusive in his language, as you suggested earlier. Uh, okay, we'll see what happens. Maybe. Maybe. Um, all right, you mentioned illegal immigration earlier, or immigration. Here in California, as many, may, many across America may not be aware, there is a rush for illegal immigrants to obtain a driver's license, a legal driver's license, now legal for them to do so. Uh, should, we be, should we be concerned about this from a security standpoint? Absolutely. And if you look at California's laws, they're relaxing their public safety laws as well. So who's really doing the vetting? How thorough are we being in our vetting of the people who apply for a driver's license? We're issuing them a government ID that looks similar. I've seen a picture of it. It looks similar to the driver's license of a U.S. citizen. Um, who's vetting them to make sure they don't have a criminal background or a history um, so that we're not handing an ID that over to, to a criminal that can be, use it for uh, yeah, it, unintended it, purposes? It's troubling. And, you know, Alex, uh, Adam, Adam Heller, I don't want to come across as someone who's anti-Hispanic or anti-immigrant, but it is troubling to think that those who are here are illegal no matter how they got here. Some got here just be, I get that they, they came here because they wanted to risk life and limb to escape poverty and do whatever they can to do it. But it's a much more dangerous world than that simplicity, than the simplicity of that. And uh, I'm concerned about, about those here illegally being legitimized. Um, you care to, care to weigh in on this? Yeah, well, there, there's also other danger. I'm going to disagree just a little bit with Jeff because uh, last week my friend Susan's father was riding his bicycle, got hit and killed by an illegal alien without a driver's license. Wow. So had he gone through training, gotten a driver's license, there's a chance Susan would still have a father today. So I think sometimes we need to balance a little bit. I understand the security and I get it. We're all concerned about that. We all have the emotions and fear and all the other things we were talking about earlier. But I don't think people are coming for those licenses. So sometimes maybe 
we want to elevate the conversation just a little bit. And yeah, see you know, how do we really protect? And, and, and that is the argument on the other side. And I, I'm not convinced that offering someone a, a legitimate driver's, a legal driver's license, prevents them from that tragic accident which happened to your friend. You believe they would have gone and got proper training. You're assuming this person didn't know how to drive in the first place? Well, I'm assuming that at least if you've passed a test and have a driver's license, but there's probably less chance that they're all over the road. Clearly, I don't know that, but it, I, I, I'm also suggesting that the chances of having a driver's license really isn't the reason anybody's gonna come here, and maybe we're down, we're chunked down too far, and if we elevate a little bit and we look at security. Yeah, if you wanna say something. Well, it just, it doesn't address the behavior. That's the problem. You hand them an ID, and maybe they take a test, and the tragedy uh, may not have been prevented, uh, because it doesn't change the behavior that that driver I, I don't I, know what happened in that I, I, be right. I believe the only thing that would have changed is, I'm assuming, and I could be wrong, that the, uh, the uh, illegal immigrant, in this case, drove away from the scene of the crime, uh, that the only thing that would have changed is they would have stayed at the scene of the crime had they had a license. I don't believe it would have prevented. He did, he did stay. He did stay. He well, did good. stay. All right. All right, we'll continue with our grassroots citizen panel on the flip side. But first, Bill Cosby's TV wife, Felicia Rashad, and his TV daughter, Keisha Knight-Pulliam, defend the embattled comedian. Which story are you buying? Back after this. Stay with me from the Edge of America. Don't go anywhere. Forget these women. What you're seeing is the destruction of a legacy. Rashad went on to say someone is determined to keep Bill Cosby off TV, and it's worked. All his contracts have been canceled. Rashad is the second member of Cosby's sitcom family to speak out this week. His former TV daughter, Keisha Knight-Pulliam, defended him on Today. I have to ask you, what do you make of those allegations? Well, what I can say is this. I wasn't there. No one was there except for the two people to know exactly what happened. All I can speak to is the man that I know and I love. The fact that he has been such an example, and you can't take away from the great that he has done. All right, welcome back, everybody. We continue with our grassroots citizen panel. An interesting topic, one which we touched upon yesterday, and we'll continue with it today. The state of Texas, the Lone Star State, represents 50% of all economic growth in America. And now we are seeing a large exodus of citizens from the Northeast and from California to Texas. Now, Alex Warrior, I believe you're a Katy, Texas native, if I'm not mistaken. Why is it? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> All right. So why is it that if the if the red state of Texas, if red states are so bad and so evil and so this and that, people are leaving blue states to go to red states to get jobs and what and including right here in the blue state of California. I guess red Republican conservative fiscal values are just really really rotten. They're terrible, aren't they? I think that you have a lot of the people on the, in the Northeast and on the left saying that you see the influx to the South because of the weather. But, you know, it was 27 degrees in Katy today, so I, it's, you know, not too much warmer there than it was here this past week. But I think what is more important to put a highlighter on is the fact that Texas doesn't have state income tax. You see people literally being taxed out of the Northeast. And so that's why you see people going to Texas. Jeff Corliss, I am not buying the, this idea that these folks are saying, we're going there because of the weather. Um, they may be saying that, but that's not why they're going. They're going because there's no state income tax. But more importantly, they're going because there's jobs. But what does it mean? Does it turn a red state of Texas purple? Does it turn a red state of Texas blue in 8, 10, 12 years? Well, sure. I mean, look, they, they want uh, greater disposable incomes. They want to increase their purchasing power. And I think... 30 to 50 years from now, if, if you actually look back at California or some of the other blue states 50 years ago, they had lower populations, they had smaller population centers. So I think as you see um, states uh, grow in population and urban areas become more saturated, um, you see them shifting that direction because the population becomes should, more diverse. Should the Republican Party be concerned about this, this demographic shift to Absolutely. Texas? Absolutely, and it's why they should be courting younger voters now and uh, looking at ways to connect and build relationships with younger voters so that 20, 30 years from now when they are the uh, older electorate that is deciding our elections, um, they've got, uh, they've got a, 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 the ability to earn their vote and their they're not immediately written off as a party by younger voters who are then 
may be seniors and are a part of the larger, larger voting bloc. Adam Heller, I'm all about nice weather, but I believe that people make a radical change in their life to move from the Northeast to Texas or what have you because of the personal financial stability, gain, or meaning that it has in their life. Is that, as a behavior expert, does that make any sense? Well, it would in, in, in your case, but everybody has different values, what's important to them. So some people, certainly, it's financial, it's jobs. Other people, it's that's where the girls or the boys are. Other people, it's where the weather is. United Van Lines came out with a study, and they showed the top eight places where people have moved and that things have gone. Actually, Oregon was number one on their study. Hmm. Everything was west and south, and I'd laid a, a little credence to the weather because I was speaking to some friends that I work with at the Mayo Clinic this morning, and it was 14 below. So I would get on any plane anywhere to get out of there and move to Texas or anywhere else. But it's really, it really is values. It's what's important to you, which is what's going to get somebody to pick up and move. Well, and actually you saw, I think in that same study, you saw people moving to California. There was a slight uptick. And so I was looking at the largest employers in the state, and so many of them are public agencies. As, as the government starts ah. to grow again, the economy's hey, Toy upticking Toyota, a little bit. Toyota, North America just announced they're leaving Los Angeles and going They're leaving. To, they're and, leaving, yeah, And public agencies are growing. So Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department uh, was one of the top employers in the state because of its size. Pretty that says a lot, Jeff. Of course. Uh, Alex, before we move on to the next topic... Uh, uh, as a Katie Texas native, um, how concerned are how concerned are, is the Republican Party there about the state turning purple or blue, given the exodus from the Northeast and the state of California, or, or are they even talking about that? Are you aware? I definitely think that there is a threat, and to nail the to follow up and nail it on the head is you have to reach out to those younger voters. I know people who are longtime conservatives and love your show who actually voted for Wendy Davis. So I think that there, there is a need to um, express that the change in Texas is it, it's coming, and it, it, we need those strong conservative voices to remain and speak louder. That is an amazing statement you just made, but. Those people show they use good judgment, at least in part of their life, their TV viewing. Um, an important topic here, very important topic. The state of California a few years ago outlawed, banned, fogwa from being served in restaurants in the state of California. Now a federal judge has lifted the ban and, has, and the ban is no longer legal. They must serve fogwa. I like the idea. Adam Heller. What is the world coming to? We can now eat foie gras in California. Uh, it means I don't have to go all the way to Montreal to get good foie gras. And, I, and I'm on the fence. I, I love foie gras. I'll eat it. I, I, don't think it's, I don't think we need to force tube feed geese to get them fat to eat it. I think we, we, we eat pretty well in California as it is. But, you know, there's legal reasons behind this stuff. And, and sometimes maybe just because it's okay doesn't mean we have to do it. Jeff Corliss, I have a friend here in town who is from France. He is politically opposite, on the opposite end of the spectrum that I am. He often likes to needle me and is a nice guy. And he's, you know, he, he talks about all these liberal successes, which I don't see. He owns a restaurant here in town. And when Fragua became banned, he became very angry and upset. And what is California all about? <laughs> it's a matter of uh, reality hitting... Um, it's liberal reality, the reality is hitting the ideology of, liberal, of liberalism here. Well, look, uh, <laughs> I don't think this story is over yet, um, simply because I think the California legislature will find some way to tax it if it's now legal. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Alex Swear, I don't believe Fragua is a big deal in Texas. Am I wrong? I don't think it's on many menus in Texas, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you know, when I was looking at this story, I was thinking, you know, the same thing has been argued with veal and how baby calves are, you know, fed, overfed truth, and whatnot. Truth. And yeah. I guess that's how Texas could relate. Well, some Cajun frog legs might be big there in the Houston area. All right, that is our grassroots system panel. <laughs> I want to thank behavioral expert Adam Heller to give a book out called Zero Pain Zero Now. Zero Pain Now. Thank you for having me again. All right. and